Got the news on Friday, as, ever, as the world did, that President Obama finally came out and said no to the Keystone XL pipeline. Here's his announcement. Several years ago, the State Department began a review process for the proposed construction of a pipeline that would carry Canadian crude oil through our heartland to ports in the Gulf of Mexico and out into the world market. Uh, this morning, Secretary Kerry informed me that after extensive public outreach and consultation with other cabinet agencies, the State Department has decided that the Keystone XL pipeline would not serve the national interests of the United States. I agree with that decision. Here's the bottom line, folks. Activism works. Had those landowners in Nebraska not made this an issue and brought it to the national forefront, I don't think we would have ever heard those words from President Obama. But to give him the benefit of the doubt, he tied it to climate change. The pipeline would not make a meaningful long-term contribution to our economy. So if Congress is serious about uh, wanting to create jobs, this was not the way to do it. So if that's the uh, case, why did it take so long for the president to get to this point? Was there constant political calculation? There was tremendous corporate pressure. The Republicans can't get enough oil going over the Olagala Aquifer, but activism works. And in the middle of the fight for years has been Jane Kleb of Bold, Nebraska. She joins us now on Ed Schultz News and Commentary. A big congratulations in order. Jane, thank you for joining us. Ah, thanks, Ed. You know, we couldn't have also done it without you at a moment where there was like this pause and this lull in the campaign. No national media on TV was paying attention to us, but you did. And so we also want to thank you today. Well, when I started looking into it, I was, I thought the pipeline was okay. I thought that uh, pipelines were safer, but uh, then when you go to Nebraska, as we did at the time, and uh, found out exactly the risk of that pipeline over the aquifer, and God forbid if there was an accident, what it would mean in the long haul, and how they couldn't clean it up, and what this oil actually was, and who was going to benefit from it, and uh, it was completely unnecessary on the world market. We're seeing that right now with the glut of oil, and also the, how it plays into the climate change uh, message to the rest of the world. So, and, and I haven't even mentioned eminent don domain yet, property rights. And so uh, I turned on it. I turned on it for factual reasons. And uh, I would think that the State Department did the same thing. The bottom line now is, is that it's going to be kicked beyond 2016 into the next presidency. What does this ruling mean, Jane, at this point? Well, it does mean that Keystone XL right now today is dead, that if TransCanada wanted to try to build a pipeline in Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska, they would not be able to legally do that. So that's obviously very good news for landowners and tribal nations. Now, I mean, of course, TransCanada tomorrow or next year could reapply, but their permit on Keystone XL has been rejected twice now. Oil prices are so low that tar sands just does not make sense. I mean, not only Keystone got rejected, but 16 projects up in the Alberta tar sands region over the last several years have been canceled and shelved because of public opposition and low oil prices. It's that combination. So I certainly think that Keystone will continue to be like when you want to know where a candidate stands on climate action, you'll say, do you approve or not approve of Keystone XL? And you will know where that candidate stands. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, and I don't buy into any of TransCanada's talking points that they're going to magically, you know, get a permit next year. Do you think the Canadian election had anything to do with this, the electing of a liberal premier, or a premier? I do. I mean, I think that there were so many factors that led to President Obama doing the right thing and rejecting Keystone. You know, Prime Minister Harper, who essentially told the president, I won't take no for an answer, which was the most arrogant thing I've ever heard a world leader tell another world leader. Um, you know, that certainly his defeat and his historic defeat, because it was a big defeat, um, definitely helped shape the narrative. Uh, Alberta, the home of tar sands, got a very liberal, essentially a Bernie Sanders-like uh, leader, which nobody thought would ever happen in that region. And she's uh, coming out. And I think she's actually getting ready to make some very broad announcements about the direction of tar sands uh, in their country. And so there were all these factors that came together. Um, but it would have never happened, as you said, Ed, without farmers and ranchers, because they were this linchpin of the first delay, which 
the environmental community needed in order to get their facts to the president. You know, uh, that energy barn that you folks built down there, there had to be a party in that thing on Friday night, was there? <laughs> <laughs> we definitely, yes, we definitely went by there on our way to Lincoln. Uh, we had a couple beers with some farmers and ranchers and some <laughs> climate activists. Um, and we've had several emails, actually, from people saying, is it okay if I go to the barn? Can I take pictures? And everybody, you know, out there listening is always welcome to go to the energy barn and, and take pictures and see your name if you donated, uh, which is posted on the outside of the barn. How big a victory is this in the totality of climate change? Uh, I mean, this, this is something that uh, I think is somewhat of a benchmark moment that, that America is serious about fossil fuels. And I won't even... Uh, and, and that aside, I want you to answer that first, but there's one political angle that I think that also played into it. Your thoughts? You know, this is a critical moment because this now is, you know, nationally we would say a line in the sand. Obviously in Nebraska we would say a line in the sand hills um, where we have put essentially a marker saying we are serious about climate change. And we believe that each of these major infrastructure projects that lock us into energy of the past for 30 to 60 to 100 years is not going to be the direction of our country if we're serious about climate action and if we're serious about protecting property rights and if we're serious about protecting people's water supply. And, you know, President Obama mentioned all of those things. And the State Department in their, you know, final report talked about how also the tribal concerns were a big factor uh, in yes. their decision. So, you know, I think that, the, yes, I definitely think this is a marker. The, tr the Native Americans were adamant about this. And uh, I, I visited the camp, as you did, about how they staked it out for months on end, about how they were going to fight to the death on this. That was the interview that I had on camera from a, a number of uh, Natives. In fact, when I went to Nebraska, there was a group of uh, Native Americans that drove six hours to meet our camera crew to tell their side of the story, which I thought was very profound. The political angle in all of this is that who would have profited? It's the Koch brothers. And that is something that really didn't get a whole lot of play by the corporate media, if any. But that is a fact, that the Koch brothers had major interests in all of this that would align their pockets and given them more resources to fight against progressive issues in this country. That's how I viewed it. No, that's absolutely right. They are one of the top leaseholders up in the tar sands region. Not only do they own land that tar sands is being mined out of, or used to be mined out of since it's kind of in a lull right now up in the Alberta region, um, but they also own a huge stake in the refineries. And they own a huge stake, the leading stake, in what's called pet coke, which is this essentially dirty form of coal. It's even dirtier than traditional American coal, uh, which China uses at very large rates. And so they would have profited. And anybody who thinks that they wouldn't have and that that's just a scare talking point from progressives and liberals, the people that were fighting us hardest in Nebraska were Coke-funded groups. It was Americans yeah. for Prosperity. It was this group called Nebraskans for Jobs, which was created, you know, by TransCanada and Coke-funded groups. And so, you know, they definitely would have made a ton of money. So it's a huge blow to the Koch brothers and Republicans. One of America's great activists, Jane Kleb. Congratulations. Bold Nebraska, keep going. It's been great to know you over the last few years and uh, seeing you do what you did. And uh, it's a bit, the country owes you a big thank you. Jane Kleb, we'll do it again. I appreciate it. All the best. Thanks, brother. You bet.